Thank you, Cheryl. At Alexandria, we like to think of ourselves as champions of change. As we work with startups and innovators in the life science and technology industries. But last night at dinner, I met a real champion of change. Our keynote speaker, Haben Gurma. Powerful stories can help to drive success. Compelling stories communicate what sets an organization or individual apart and how that difference can serve as an advantage. Haben Gurma is a talented storyteller who helps to frame difference as an asset. Born deaf blind, Haben fought off low expectations. Choosing to create her own pioneering story rooted in her belief that inclusion is a choice. She is the first deaf blind person to graduate from Harvard Law School. And she also holds a bachelor's degree in sociology and anthropology from Lewis and Clark College. <laughs> she developed a powerful path to success by mastering self-advocacy and furthered those skills through legal advocacy. Because of her disability rights advocacy, Haben has earned international acclaim and has been honored as a White House champion of change by President Barack Obama and President Bill Clinton, among others. <laughs> Haben has been featured extensively in media around the world, including the BBC, NBC, NPR, and earning recognition as Forbes 30 Under 40 and BBC Women of Africa Hero. Ladies and gentlemen, please bring a warm welcome to Haben Gurma. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for Corinne for that great introduction. As Corinne told you, I'm deaf blind, so I can't see that there are people in the audience, and I can't hear a lot of the auditory feedback. So what I'm doing, I have a braille display and digital braille pops up at the bottom. And my interpreter, April, is sitting with a wireless keyboard. So she's gonna be watching and listening and typing. And I'm gonna read audience feedback. So if people are smiling, laughing, engaged, she's gonna type and tell me. She says you're clapping. <laughs> but she'll also tell me if people look bored. My name is Haven Grima, and the name Haven comes from Eritrea. It's a small African country. Ethiopia borders to the south, and to the north is the Red Sea. My mother grew up in Eritrea during the war between Eritrea and Ethiopia. There was a lot of violence in the streets. Fear spilled into the classroom as well. Stories were a way to escape the violence and fear. Stories are powerful. Stories influence the organizations we build, the products we design, and the futures we imagine for ourselves. My mother heard stories that told her America is the land of freedom. America is the land of opportunities. Inspired by these stories, she took the difficult journey walking from Eritrea to Sudan. She spent several months in Sudan as a refugee, and a refugee organization helped her come to the United States. Several years later, older, wiser, 
my mother realized geography doesn't create justice. People create justice. Communities create justice. All of us face the choice to accept the oppression around us or advocate for justice. As the daughter of refugees, of black women, disabled, stories sometimes say my life doesn't matter. I choose to create my own stories. I choose to believe that difference is an asset. And I found ways to access information and not let disability or difference be a barrier. Deaf blindness is a spectrum of limited vision and hearing. I found alternative solutions for just about everything. For example, Braille. I read all my books in Braille. If something, if, if something is in print, I could find ways to get that converted to Braille so that I can read it. I use computers with screen readers Screen readers are software that converts graphical information to speech or digital braille. I travel around with a guide dog. Her name is Maxine, and she's trained to navigate around obstacles, stairs, cars. I can also use a white cane. I've received training with a white cane. I salsa dance. I can't hear the music, but I can feel the rhythm and musicality through the people I dance with. There's always a way to do something. We just need to find those alternative solutions to access information. One of my first days in law school, the classmates sitting next to me couldn't figure out how to say hi to me. She waved but I couldn't see it. She voiced hi, but I couldn't hear it. It was our first day of international law, and she wasn't thinking about international law. She was thinking about how to get my attention. So as a student, she did the most logical thing for a student. She went onto Facebook and sent me a message saying, hi, Havin, I'm sitting right next to you. I don't know about you, but I actually don't use Facebook in class. <laughs> After class, I saw the message and I reached out to her. I explained that I use a braille display and keyboard and she's welcome to type on the keyboard and I'll be able to read what she's writing. When people first meet me, the first question is usually, how do you communicate? The second question is usually, have you heard of Helen Keller? <laughs> yes, actually. <laughs> Helen Keller was an amazing deaf-blind woman. She lived from 1880 to 1968. She spent her whole life advocating for women's rights, racial equality, disability rights, she dedicated her life to social justice. Yet people often just reduce her to one thing, a deaf blind woman who learned to say the word water. There's so much more to people with disabilities. There's a lot of diversity within our community. It's important to know that disability is never the barrier. I use the word disability I identify as a person with a disability. The word isn't the problem. It's the attitudes and stigma that's the problem. So it's okay to continue using the words, but just change the attitudes associated with the words. 
When Helen was looking for college to attend, Harvard wouldn't admit her. Back then, Harvard was only for men. Her disability didn't hold her back. She was brilliant and hardworking. Her gender didn't hold her back. Women are brilliant and hardworking. It was the community at Harvard that chose to practice exclusion. As another example, Helen's community wouldn't allow her to experience marriage. Helen fell in love, secretly got engaged, but her family prevented her from marrying the person she loved. Helen's disability didn't stop her from feeling love. She wrote extensively about love, but her family, her community, created insurmountable barriers. All the barriers that exist are created by people, and it's up to all of us to work together to remove those barriers. When I was in college, I thought about what can I do as an individual to remove the barriers in my community. I went to Lewis and Clark College. It's a small college in Portland, Oregon. The cafeteria served as a fun place for people to relax between classes. It's a large room, the cafeteria. Along three of the walls are large windows showcasing Portland's rain. <laughs> On the fourth wall were food stations, and people would walk in, browse the print menu, and then go to their station of choice. The print menu was not accessible to blind students like myself. Blindness was not the problem. I can access information if it's in Braille. So it was the menu that was the problem, not the disability. I went to the cafeteria manager and explained, this menu isn't accessible. Can you provide the menu in Braille? Or can you email it so I can read it with a screen reader? And the manager told me they're very busy. I need to stop complaining and be more appreciative. <laughs> but if there's chocolate cake at station four and no one tells me, <laughs> I'm not feeling appreciative. I have really good navigation skills. With a guide dog or a white cane, I can navigate the campus independently. I can navigate that cafeteria independently. So if they gave me a menu that said station one, hamburgers, station two, tortellini with smoked gouda cheese, I could know to skip station one and go straight to station two. <laughs> but they didn't provide me the information. Back then, I was practicing, I was eating vegetarian. And that's hard to do when you don't have access to food information. For the first few months, I tolerated the situation. I told myself, at least I have food. Many people around the world don't have access to food. So who am I to complain? My mother spent many months in Sudan as a refugee. And there I was in Portland, getting an education. Who was I to complain? I was worried that maybe I should just shut up and put up with the situation. And I talked to my friends, and I told them, I don't have access to the food information. Should I do something, or should I just put up with the situation? And they told me, it's my choice. It's our choice to advocate for ourselves or put up with oppression. In 1990, Congress passed the Americans with Disabilities Act. The ADA prohibits discrimination against people with disabilities. Places of public accommodation, like schools, cafeterias, are required by law to accommodate individuals with disabilities. I wrote a letter to the cafeteria manager explaining about the Americans with Disabilities Act. 
accommodations for blind students includes providing access to the menu. And if they wouldn't provide me access, then I would sue. <laughs> I had no idea how I would do that. <laughs> I was 19. I couldn't afford a lawyer. But I knew that if we're determined, we'll find a way. My mom found a way to greater opportunities. The whole world, and even the United States, was a big unknown to her, yet she made the journey. So I needed to make my own journey and find a way to advocate for myself. And I did. After teaching the cafeteria about the ADA, Everything changed. They realized that I wasn't asking for favors. I was asking them to comply with the law. And it changed the culture at the cafeteria. They started providing menus in accessible formats. For me, life became delicious. The following year, another blind student came to that college, and he had immediate access to the cafeteria menu. He didn't have to fight, he didn't have to advocate. And I realized that when I make changes in our community, it benefits other people. It's not just about me, it's about our whole community. And that experience inspired me to become a disability rights lawyer and go to law school. In 2010, in 2010, I entered Harvard Law School. Harvard told me, we've never had a deaf blind student before. And I told Harvard, I've never been to Harvard Law School before. <laughs> we didn't have all the answers but we pioneered our way using assistive technology and high expectations. You can always find solutions. There's always an alternative way to access information. I now work as a disability rights lawyer, traveling around the world, teaching people about our rights, inclusion, and all the different ways we can reach our dreams. People with disabilities are the largest minority group. Around the world, there are 1.3 billion people with disabilities. This is a huge market. Companies who make their services accessible benefit by reaching more people. Disability also drives innovation. Accessibility features end up benefiting the whole community. Curb cuts were built to help people with wheelchairs get on and off the sidewalks. Now parents pushing strollers, travelers with luggage on wheels, skateboarders, all of these different groups benefit from curb cuts. Captions on videos allows deaf individuals to access the audio content on videos. It also benefits hearing people. Facebook reports that videos with caption have a higher view time. View time increases by 12% when captions are included. So as you go through your careers, in school, your future companies, think about inclusion. Think about making your services accessible. It'll benefit you, increase growth, and drive innovation. All of you have strengths and talents. It's up to you to choose to believe in yourself, to choose that you're worth it, and find those solutions that'll allow you to reach your dream. Thank you for being here with me, and I hope you'll join me in making our world more inclusive for everyone.